University, Professor Srinath Barwa, respected Dr. Arujuti Choudhury, my colleagues from university, <coughs> colleagues from other colleges of Guwahati, and student friends. Today, I consider it a very sacred occasion. Sacred because of three reasons. Firstly, because I am standing here to deliver a lecture at the prestigious Krishna Kanta Pandikoi University, named after the illustrious son of Assam. It is, a, as you all know, a very upcoming university, and I can see the progress. I'm very happy to see the progress of this university. I am standing here to deliver a lecture at this place. Secondly, this university is celebrating the World Philosophy Day. The World Philosophy Day is actually on 19th of, also 19th of November, which is supposed to be the birthday of Socrates. But due to some technical reasons, it is celebrated today. It is a very auspicious occasion. And thirdly, because the lecture is on the relevance of Gandhian philosophy, the father of the nation, and who is the most prominent personality of India. Mahatma Gandhi, so famous in, in not only in India but abroad, throughout the globe. He was not a very intelligent person. He himself said that he was not a very brilliant, he didn't have a brilliant academic career. Neither he was physically very strong, neither he was a great professional person, neither he was a very handsome person, but he was the most charismatic person of the world. A person clad in a dhoti up to his knees. The question is, what makes this person, such a frail looking person, so very great? And Indeed, there are answers to this question. It is known that Mahatma Gandhi was chiefly known in our country and abroad as a person who is responsible for bringing about the independence of India, freeing India from, from the yoke of the British. But that is not the only contribution of Mahatma Gandhi. He, his contribution, I feel, is particularly for his character, the ideals, the thoughts that he gave to the nation as a whole, to the people of the nation. We must note the fact that though Gandhi is often described as a politician, it is not the politics that made him great, but it is the spiritual outlook behind all the activities of Mahatma Gandhi, be it in the political field, be it in the economic field, be it in the social field, and so on and so forth. We, I, will check, I will take the relevance one by one. First, I will deal with the spiritual aspect of Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi's faith in God is well known. To quote Gandhi, I'll be quoting Gandhi now and then. To quote Gandhi, you may pluck up my eyes, but that will not kill me. You may chop off my nose, but that will not kill me either. You may cut off my hands and arms, but I will still continue to live. But blast off my belief in God, and I am dead. So it is this belief in God, the belief in the spiritual outlook, that that has given the strength <coughs> to all the activities and activities of Mahatma Gandhi. It is the spiritual outlook which is always at the background. His ideas of Swadeshi, his ideas of Brahmacharya, his ideas of Ahimsa, his ideas of Swaraj, all are from the background of the Hindu religion. <coughs> But he himself claims that it is not only the Hindu, Hindu religion that has influenced him. The religions of Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Jainism were all at the background of his ideas. Gandhi said, I have nothing new to give to the world. What I say is as old as the hills. The logic, where lies the uniqueness of Gandhi? If all that Gandhi says 
here is found in the Vedas and the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. Where lies the, where lies the uniqueness? Where lies the relevance? Gandhi himself gave answer to this question that the only thing that I did was to apply these universal principles to the day-to-day -day activity of the people. So Gandhi was the most practical philosopher, I should say. He was the philosopher, yes, he did not give us anything new. We find them in our scriptures. We find them in the Bhagavad Gita, we find them in the Upanishads, in the Rig Vedas, in the Quran, in the New Testament, and so on and so forth. But he was the first person, maybe he, there were other person, but no, never did a person strongly enforce or strongly apply these spiritual principles to the life of a day-to-day -day man. And it is not only the individual man that has been influenced by the spiritual outlook, it is the countrymen, the people as a whole, because Gandhi believes that the Swaraj of the individual is the Swaraj of the people is the Swaraj of the sum total of all the individuals. Because it is the basically it is the grassroots, the individual, which is important. If one individual changes, the world change, world can be changed. Because he can influence his neighbor, he can influence his students if he's a teacher, a parent, parents can influence their children, and so on and so forth. So the grassroots, the individual, is very, very important according to Gandhi. Gandhi did not try to find religion in some, in some solitary place. He said, in search of God, I did not go to the Himalayan cave or to the forest. Because Gandhi believed that God can be found amidst humanity. That is why he fought the cause of the poor people, the Narayan as he called it. His dharma is known as Manav Dharma because religion lies amidst the people. If we serve the people, we serve God. So that aspect of Gandhi is very, very important to make religion practical, to carry religion to the people at large. And in all his activities, two important spiritual principles of Gandhi were very, very important truth and non-violence, as we all know, satya and ahimsa. <coughs> Taking the case of truth, Gandhi converted the sentence, uh, the, the sense of uh, God, he said that God is truth. Now this important sentence, God is truth, has a far greater significance than is ordinarily thought to be. Because when, when he said that God is truth, Truth is something which is applicable to everybody. There may be non-believers in God, but there cannot be any non-believers in truth. Truth is universal in character. Truth is universal. And even the atheist who does not believe in God believes in truth. So he gave a secular outlook to this concept of God. It is not the God of Hinduism which he prizes. It is not the God of Islam or any particular religion that it rises, but it is the universal truth to which every religion leads. And when he says God is truth, he gives a secular outlook to the whole problem, to the whole concept. Coming to non-violence, Gandhi converted this non-violence as a special meaning for Gandhi. It is not, he does not mean that non-violence means only doing no non-harm or non-injury to any living being. That is the ordinary sense in which we use the word non-violence. But according to non-violence, it has a far broader meaning. Non-violence is non-violence in thought, non-violence in word, non-violence in deed. So it has a far greater, the word non-violence has a far greater significance. And this non-violence and truth are the foundation of Gandhi's, the, the great building on which Gandhi, the, the, that Gandhi has built on these two great foundations, truth and nonviolence. Now this nonviolence also has certain exceptions, no doubt. Now the question is, the most common question is as Professor uh, Srinath Barua has already pointed out, 
how far is this non-violence applied today? Is it relevant today? Now, Gandhi also had certain answers to that problem. He had certain answers, how far is the concept of non-violence relevant? Because physical life that we are living today, that we are alive today, also involves certain violence. We are thriving on non-vegetarian food, which, is, which means that we are indulging in some form of violence. We take meat, we take fish, we take certain things, and for our own benefit we have to kill lives. We kill mosquitoes, we live, kill ants, so on. We have to kill germs. So our very existence entails some amount of violence. And Gandhi too admits that. And Gandhi too says that the law of non-violence, which is a great law, has certain, definitely has certain exceptions. For example, the lady, the lady who was gang raped. Gandhi said in such cases, long back, years back, Gandhi said, that every woman who is assaulted has the right to defend her honor even by applying violence. She has to save her dignity at any cost, even if it means by killing the person who is trying to rape her. For example, uh, an animal which is ridden in pain, which is ridden in pain and is suffering from a disease which is incurable, we have every right to end the life of that particular animal. So Gandhi gives certain exceptions where non-violence as an ideal can be violated. Can be violated. And when there was a comparison between non-violence and cowardice, cowardice, Gandhi said, if you ask me which alternative to accept when there is a conflict between non-violence and cowardice, Gandhi said, I would definitely prescribe violence than prescribing cowardice. In other words, violence, uh, cowardice is even worse than violence. And non-violence, as I have already mentioned, does not mean physical injury. If I hate somebody, greed, lust, hatred towards anybody, if I have filth in my mind and I'm non-violent, physically non-violent, it does not mean anything. My non-violence must find expression in love, in positive love. So love towards everybody, not only towards human beings, not only towards my neighbors, love to even the meanest of creation, the animal kingdom, Gandhi for for club against the slaughter of cows. But it is not only the cow slaughter that he prohibited. It is in, uh, it is in a broad sense the prohibition of the slaughter of animals, doing violence to animals. So it is positive love towards every creature on earth. And this concept of non-violence, Gandhi said, is based on the essential Advaita principle that is Aham Brahmashmi, that is, I am the Brahman. The whole unity, the, the whole creation is one because it is the creation of Brahman. Brahman Satyam Jagat Mithya, Brahma Jiva Brahma Ibarma So everything is identical, there is the unity, and this principle is at the background of Gandhi's philosophy of truth and nonviolence. But coming to the political field, let us come to the political field. Gandhi gave us the important concepts of Swaraj, Swadeshi, and so on and so forth. Now, one important fact must be noted here regarding politics. People generally believe that politics is a dirty affair, and therefore it is to be avoided. <coughs> dirty, uh, Gandhi said that politics is as sacred as any other aspect of human life. In a famous book, Mahatma Gandhi, 100 years, the famous writer, Toyin B, has given us a expression, he has written in that book, Mahatma Gandhi, 100 years. He compares Gandhi to Buddha,
Buddha, Ashoka, Muhammad, Jesus, and so on and so forth. And at last comments that Gandhi excels all of them. Ashoka, Buddha, they were born beings. Buddha ran out of politics. He just ran away of politics. Ashoka did become a king. But after the famous Kalinga battle, he gave up warfare. He was king only in name, but he was more interested in the Buddhist principles and the philosophical or spiritual principles. Jesus and Muhammad, they were, they indulged in, in politics due to the need of the time. During Muhammad, the, Muhammad's time, we know how it compelled Muhammad to take active take some part in the political affairs of the country due to political unrest. But Mahatma Gandhi himself became, uh, took part in active politics. This was because Mahatma Gandhi purified politics. There was the political mud, as we find today. Political mud, political impurities, even in those days it was there. Though, though it is more today, the political corruptions and other things, though it is more today, it was prevalent even in older times. The story of Mahabharata, we see that dishonesty, deceitfulness were so much present, were so much prevalent even in that age. But Mahatma Gandhi died his best to purify politics. He waded through the political mud and purified them himself. He stayed away from the political sluggishness, from the political mud, from the political impurities, and showed to the world, presented to the world, that politics can be sacred as any other aspect of human life. Gandhi gave us the concept of a stateless society, a society without a state. And But this, I should say, was merely an idea. How far it is relevant today, it is a question. No doubt, there cannot be people without a state. But Gandhi himself said that it is only an ideal. It is only an ideal because people should be there, try to govern themselves. And he believed in the principle that that government is the best which governs the least. Because political interference, too much of political in interference saps the freedom and the creativity of the people. At every moment, if you have the fear that somebody will interfere with your freedom, somebody will interfere with your acts and what you do and what you not do, then like communism, there will be, the creativity will be lost. He had strongly had that feeling. And therefore, ample freedom should be given to the people so that each person can rule himself. Swaraj, what is the meaning of Swaraj? Swaraj is essentially is a word which was not coined by Mahatma Gandhi. It was a word found in the Taittiriya Upanishad. In the Taittiriya Upanishad, we find a brilliant, a beautiful sloka which says, Pranaram mana, mana anandam, shanti samriddham swarajya. So what is swaraj? Swaraj is a state, a condition of mind actually, where there is peace, complete bliss and happiness. Pranaram mana anandam, that which gives ananda to your mind. Shanti, peace, samriddhi, samriddham. Swaraj, and that is Swaraj. So Swaraj is actually the rule of the self. Gandhi believed that if I am ruled by my own self, self means not simply my body, my individual self, but the spirit within me, which is so pure, which is so simple. If I am ruled by that self, it is used in the spiritual sense, in the philosophical sense, not in the ordinary sense. If I am ruled by myself, then I will be, I'll rule myself in such a manner that I do not need any external interference. So that government is 
the best which governs the least. Yes, government is necessary. A state is necessary because without a minimum interference of the state, might will become right. We will go to the go back to the ancient, you know, state of a lawless society, a society without law. So certain ideals, it is, it is a kind of utopia, it is a kind of ideal. Ideal may not be always actualized, but definitely it points out to a condition which should be our aim, which we should strive for. Gandhi's ideal of Swadeshi. Swadeshi is something that we should keep our wants limited to a particular place. And Gandhi spoke of the principle of minimization of human wants. Again, here he was influenced by the Isha Upanishad, Isha Vaishya Midam Sarvam, Yat Kincha Jagatyam Jagat, Tena Tak Tena Punjita, Mahavrita Kasya Siddhanam. He said that we must first renounce. You have the right to enjoy, but enjoy only by renouncing, by your sacrifice which is not seen in today's world. Today, the ideal is only to earn and earn and earn. Earn for whom? For myself. Do I care for others? Not at all. This is the scenario of today's economic life, today's political. I'm earning for myself without being concerned about my neighbor, for anybody. My only ideal is my only Worry is to amass the huge amount of wealth for myself, which was against Gandhi's idea, which was against the idea taught by our sages and seers long back from the ancient times. So that very <coughs> idea of the Isha Upanishad, that you must first sacrifice, you must first renounce in order to enjoy. The basic minimum Economic comfort is a must. I have to eat and live. I have to eat, drink and live. I have to clothe myself. I need a decent house to live in. These essential things are necessary. I need proper education. I need proper medical facilities, no doubt. As Swami Vivekananda said, you cannot teach philosophy and metaphysics to a hungry man. For the only food the only thing that a hungry man needs is invigorating food. Yes, the minimum economic necessity must be fulfilled. But beyond that amassing the huge, of, huge amount of wealth is a crime. Crime not only to myself, but crime against the society. So Gandhi gave us the wonderful concept of trusteeship. Trusteeship is a method invented by Gandhi, discovered by Gandhi, and what is that? I should keep for myself only as much as I need. And the rest of the property should be used for the welfare of the society. Does it happen? Is it, it is a very, very relevant thing for today's India. India, which is described as a socialistic pattern of society, is not at all socialistic. The social is it neither socialistic nor democratic in the true sense of the term. Though India has been described as so socialistic dem democracy, it is neither neither democracy nor capitalism, because everybody is running after wealth, abundance of wealth. So this is the greatest crime which of which we should we, which we should try to get rid of. And trusteeship is the beautiful principle which, if it could be practiced, could have solved many of the problems of today's India. But the most often quoted question or given question against trusteeship is that, is how far is the concept of trusteeship relevant in today's India? Because this Method of trusteeship must also be implemented according to Gandhi by means of non-violence. We cannot coerce or force a person to give up his wealth. I cannot use violence to
to compel a person to give up his excess wealth, and then also I have to apply the method of nonviolence. If I apply the method of nonviolence, then will the person give up his wealth? Then the honesty of the trustee must have must be assumed. I have to assume that a particular person is honest and he will declare that he has so much of wealth, he has kept for himself this much of wealth, and he has given that excess wealth for the welfare of the society. Are the people that honest? We have to assume it. This is a question, a thoughtful question that I pose to this house. Coming to the other aspects of uh, Gandhi's economy. He gave us his theory of production, he gave us his theory of consumption, he gave us his theory of distribution. Production according to Gandhi should be production by the masses, by the masses, and he was against, as we all know, against large-scale industrialization. He was always for the, bet uh, for the betterment of the society. He wanted to set up cottage and small-scale industries. He encouraged them. Because he pointed out many reasons why he was in the famous book, Hind Swaraj. Gandhi gave, up, uh, gave us many of the reasons why he opted for small-scale industries rather than large-scale industries. Because large-scale industries lead to many problems. Problems of overcrowding, problems of exploitation, problems of pollution, atmospheric pollution, <coughs> problem of uh, exploitation of one class by the, the laborer class by the capitalist class, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the problems of large-scale industrialization, and Gandhi did not want to encourage large-scale industrialization. But there also he gave us certain exceptions, because it is obvious that certain things cannot be produced locally, or by means of small cottage and small-scale industries. For example, certain medicines, certain drugs that are used for the saving of human life, it, it must be imported from other countries. Electricity, shipbuilding, etc. The examples he had given in those times. Nowadays, there are so many items that we need and we cannot do without it. So, I think this part of Gandhi is a bit ir irrelevant in today's society. Because in the present age of globalization, we cannot always implement the concept of Sodeshi and La, and this and uh, ex excessive influence, uh, excessive importance to cottage and small scale industries only, ignoring the large scale industries. So I think this part needs some amount of revision of Gandhi's ideas. I have to point out certain re revisions that are essential also. I cannot say Mahatma Gandhi is 100% relevant in modern India in, or in today's times. So that part I feel that emphasis on industrialization that's too much emphasis of course yes too much emphasis on industrialization leads to certain problems even in my present times because it leads to the problem of unemployment the work that is done by a machine replaces the work done by 100 people so it, work done by machines is needed because it is more faster, time saving, and it saves a lot of money also. But it leads to the problem of unemployment. And in dealing with the solution, in trying to solve the problem of unemployment, cottage and the emphasis on cottage and small scale industries has to be revived. That part is important. Because now we have come to a position or in a, in a condition in India where so many youths are un unemployed and we, the government we know is going back to the Gandhian policy of helping the modern youth to set up certain small scale industries, be it farming, you know, farming, cultivating a small, small plot of land, growing tea, growing certain vegetables and fruits within their limits and uh, um, 
uh, weaving cloth in their own house and so on and so forth. So many such avenues are pointed out by the present government by giving loan and other facilities. But it has to go, go further in order to solve the problem of unemployment. Then regarding the concept of distribution, Gandhi pointed out that the maxim of equal distribution, that is, he preached the concept of economic equality. Everybody should get equal amount of wages, equal amount of things. Gandhi prescribed that whether it is a, he is a farmer or a doctor or an engineer or a barber or a cultivator, he should get equal wages as far as practicable. But this getting of equal wages, how far is it practicable in today's society? Is it practicable? The getting of equal wages, a teacher, a doctor, an engineer, a scavenger, a daily laborer, can they get can they all get equal wages? In this concept of equality, Gandhi said that we have to take into consideration the need of the people. How much do I need? A bachelor definitely needs much more, uh, much less than a person having 10 members in his family. Because he gave an example in this aspect, he said, an elephant needs a thousand times more food than an ant. The amount that an ant consumes and an amount the elephant consumes cannot be made equal. Similarly, a person having 10 members in the family cannot be given equal wages as a person having two members in the family. Moreover, there are other considerations that one should take note of, whether he has small children, whether he has elderly parents, because elderly parents need more care, they need medicine, they need medical facilities, and younger children, small children, need education and other things. So it differs how much he, Gandhi himself pointed out that these considerations must be taken into account. But as far as practicable, I'm quoting Gandhi, as far as practicable, we should try, it should be a maxim to give equal wages to all. Now here also I pose a question. Let the audience, let everybody think, is it possible to give equal wages as far as practical? Now regarding consumption again, we come back to the concept of minimization of human wants, that we should keep our wants limited as far as practical. Now there have been so many other concepts of Gandhi in the economic field, which needs to be re-evaluated. We have to see whether they are applicable in today's society or not. <coughs> Coming to the social aspect, Gandhi was against the, the uh, uh, prevalent custom of untouchability. Untouchability, Gandhi gave so much importance on untouchability that he even forced his wife to clean the toilet of an untouchable. He fought for establishing equal rights of all the people in the society. And he was the person responsible for elevating the status of the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes. The preamble of the Indian constitution to establish justice, social, economic, and political, liberty, fraternity, and equality of status and opportunity, promoting welfare of all. These are some of the issues which have been enshrined in the famous constitution of India. Article 45 and 46 of the Indian constitution gives right to the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Now these this is the fruit, what we have in the Constitution today, the fundamental rights and the directive principles of state's policy enshrined in the Constitution are the fruits that we have reaped due to the Gandhian ideals. But, 
but how far? There have been so many amendments in the Indian Constitution. You will know how many amendments in the Indian Constitution that have taken place. But I feel that there should be further amendments so that the ideals do not remain mere ideals. Yes, if you go to the court, you file a suit. If you are not given justice, if you are not given justice, you go to the court and file a suit. But you know the system, legal system of today. Years and years pass by and people do not get justice. Yes, it is very much there in the Constitution, but does it happen practically? Do people get real justice? Many a case, many a times we see that people simply die without their cases being solved. So promptness, promptness in judiciary is a very essential factor. It is not enough that I have that I write something in a book and just keep it as a scripture. But I must be able to implement what I believe in. This, this fact of implementation is something what is lacking in today's India. Ideals, Indian ideals are beautiful. Gandhi's ideals are beautiful. We have beautiful ideals. Even in our scriptures we have beautiful ideals. But how far are we implementing those ideals? In the true sense of the term. The delay, the delay in re receiving justice is a very important matter that we should think about. Gandhian ideals are such that it prescribes certain important things. Gandhi says that there should not be there should not be word there should not be worship without work. There should not be trade and commerce without morality. There should not be politics, politics without principles. There should not be economics without justice. Yes, morality must be very much there. It is not enough that we secure, we strive for a good end. Gandhi discussed this question about means and ends. Most of the cases what we see, our ends are noble, we have noble ends. But the means that we employ to secure that end is important. He gives, gives us a beautiful example for this, that a tree, tree bearing fruits of poison cannot give us nectar. <coughs> if the fruit is poisonous, then the nectar from it will, it will be poisonous. So the means must be, so here he differs with Karl Marx and Lenin. According to Marx, the end justifies the means. But to secure social equality, to secure unity and brotherhood, according to Marx, we can employ even violence. But Gandhi does not prescribe to that view. If the end is good, the means employed must also be good. In other words, the means employed to secure a good end must also be a non-violent means. So if you want independence, if you want to have our rights, if you want justice, we cannot go and simply kill people for the sake of justice, for the sake of equality. We have to win it by method of non-violence. And he prescribed the great ideal of Satyagraha, non-cooperation movement. And the Indian War of Independence was secured by that powerful weapon, the weapon of Satyagraha. Not only here, even in South Africa, people imitated it. In the West, people imitated the mess. Professor Borwa already pointed out, even in the West, Gandhism or Gan this ism, of course, again is a debatable fact that Gandhi did not want to use the word ism for his philosophy because 
He has not said anything new, but for our purpose, we call it Gandhi's, Gandhism, or we call it Gandhian. Gandhism or Gandhian philosophy is more implemented in the West, as he pointed out. And so many countries in the West have imitated Gandhi. He is, he is uh, praised, and we have, we have the statue of Gandhi even in the famous museum in London. So everywhere he is worshipped, but in India, the relevance of Gandhi, which is so very important, is not practiced in the way as it should have been practiced. Violence, confusion, intolerance, exploitation, murder, killings, so many facts. As we see in today's India, they are, they are growing and growing. And people are, people live in fear, in the grip of fear everywhere. And we should always try this. When this fear is within us, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of the famous poem by Rabindranath Tagore, where the mind is without fear. Where Rabindranath pointed out that the condition of a of a country should be such that there is no fear, any kind of fear. Spiritual fear is the greatest hampering factor to our development. We should have a condition or a society where the society is not broken up by narrow domestic walls, Ramindranath's language. So we move about when we go out at night, if ladies go out at night, we are always in the grip of fear that we move about. Even after so many years of Indian independence, people are not safe. People's mind are not without fear. People are always thinking of what will happen to tomorrow, whether I'm going to live tomorrow or not. Corruption is so rampant today that I cannot trust even my near and dear ones. Because people are so full of corruption. So I feel that in order to solve the present day problems, Gandhian, Gandhi is the only alternative. True, Gandhi is not relevant in certain cases. For example, Gandhian ideal of Swadeshi may not be implemented, may, we may not be able to implement Swadeshi to the extent that Gandhi wanted. Today we cannot have a Ram Rajya, the ideal Ram Rajya of Gandhi's times. Because Ram Rajya is a condition where all will have enough to eat, drink, he will be happy, he will be in, there will be no misery anywhere. It is just as a condition of, condition of heaven. It is a condition of heaven which we cannot expect to have in today's society with so much of population everywhere around us. Population is a great barrier. Gandhi spoke at a time when there was so, the population in India was much less. So there may be certain deficiencies in Gandhi. He is not a god. He is an ordinary, he was an ordinary human being like all of us. So every ideology has a plus and minus has both a good side and a bad side. There may be certain drawbacks. He gave us a system of education. He gave us a system of education where he preached of education, imparting education in the mother tongue, in one's own mother tongue. This was a very noble idea. But what we see today, our own, I am ashamed to say that even my own sons, they cannot speak Assamese properly in the sense that they do not know some of the words. My own, my own son when he was young, he used to ask me, what is, what is uh, that word called? Uh, certain, certain Assamese words which we doesn't understand, which we often use, what is Nidjaton? I was so ashamed that I could not teach my son what Nidjaton is. What is Onokhandhan? These are some of the words which I could not teach my son when he was very young. Now, now of course they know. But that was the reason why Gandhi said that up to a certain age one should get education through the medium of one's mother tongue. 
English is a must. We have become slave to English. We cannot get rid of it very soon. We see, go around the world and see. German people do not know how to speak English. French people do not know how to speak English. They are all European countries. But English is not their medium. English is not their medium of instruction. They have beautiful books in their own language. We are slave to English. We cannot get rid of it soon, no doubt. But at least some emphasis can be given to our mother tongue. There can be good books in our mother tongue. And Gandhi spoke about all around development of education, of a person by means of education. So this all around development means development physically, mentally, spiritually, in all aspects. University degrees or college degrees does not mean simply offering a degree but the all-round development of a child, all-round development of a student is very, very important. And especially emphasis should be given, emphasis should be given on character building. So these are some of the things which we think are, which appears that it is not something great, but they are very useful. They are very useful for the present day society and we should take note of all those things. So if our society, if India has to be a good, a real India, if our society has to be a good society, we have, there is no alternative to Gandhi. We have to follow the Gandhian method only if with, without, with, with, by, only with certain modifications. So if we want that untouchability should go, then we should have faith in the maxim that all men are brothers. If we want that disproportionate wealth and income should go, then we should have faith in the principle of minimization of human wants. If we want to have a proper education, we should have faith in the ancient system of education, which they're more important to spiritual upliftment rather than economic upliftment. So, Gandhi is very, very relevant today. And he was a person who gave us, who gave us the beautiful ideals, who gave us beautiful structure, and how far we implement them. It depends on the individuals who form the society. Because it is the individuals who are going to implement the Gandhian ideals. And with these remarks, I conclude my lecture. Thank you. Thank you.